。好，观众朋友，欢迎您收看这次的特别节目。随着博古开来和王立军被判刑，薄熙来被双开和官方公布的对他的定罪，博王案件似乎已经接近尾声。但是案件背后所隐藏的另一个惊天黑幕，已经越来越多的被人们所议论和关注，那就是王立军。博古开来和薄熙来都有份参与的活摘法轮功学员器官的惊天罪恶。那么今天呢，我们请来了 Mr. David m a t t e s 大卫麦塔斯先生。麦塔斯先生呢是加拿大著名的人权律师和社会活动家，他毕业于牛津大学，在法律方面多有建树，是加拿大勋章和多项国家级和世界级奖项的获得者。二零一零年呢，他也获得了诺贝尔和平奖的提名。二零零六年，麦达斯先生和大卫·乔高开始独立调查有关在中国大陆对法轮功学员进行活体摘除器官的指控，并陆续出版了两本书，《Bloody Harvest》血腥的器官摘取和《State Organ》国家器官。可以这么说，大卫·麦达斯先生是最接近和最了解。这个真相的西方人。Welcome to our studio, Mr. David Mattis. Thank you for inviting me. I know you have a busy schedule here in Toronto for the book launching events. So, how the book launching events goes? We've had one so far in Hamilton,、uh, and we're having another one this afternoon in Toronto. The、uh, launch was a launch of six books that were published at the same time, and. Uh, everybody brought their friends and relatives, and it was a huge crowd.、Uh, so it was a very successful book launch. As a Canadian lawyer, why you wrote a book like this, and why so many Canadian people are interested in this kind of thing? I mean, organ harvesting in China. Why a lawyer?、Uh, and、uh, I, I would say that、uh, the our legal skills involved here.、Uh, Uh, evidentiary skills and standard skills. The, as a lawyer, I'm used to assessing evidence, weighing evidence, gathering evidence, looking at standard of proof, burden of proof,、uh, the, uh, the determining whether evidence is reliable or not. And, and these are all skills that are very useful in a case like this, where we're not dealing with、um, a one clear-cut, unequivocal piece of evidence, where we're dealing with. Different evidentiary strands, and the question is how they weave together, and, and, and which of them、uh, can be、uh, relied on, and which have to be discounted. In fact,、uh, it's partly because I'm a lawyer that th- this work got done, because a lot of this type of work,、uh, human rights abuse, is, is done by human rights organizations, which are lay people. Organ- I mean, they may have some lawyers as employees, but、uh, th- they're Basically, lay people, and what they're trying to do is get information that's immediately accessible to the public.、Uh, and, and usually, what they want is something clear, straightforward, and simple that can be、uh, put into a sentence.、Uh, what, what they're looking for is activism, not not an,、uh, an elaborate proof.、Uh, and, and anything that takes a lot of effort to prove, or a lot of time to prove,、uh, or is complex to prove. It's it's too difficult for a, a lay organization engaged in activism to really get engaged in. So, to a certain extent, my being a lawyer and having these legal skills was,、uh, I would say, essential to come to come to grips with the issue. Why Canadians?、Uh, well, the、uh, I would say that、uh, the advantage Canada has a couple of advantages.、Uh, one is. Uh, we're multicultural, and、uh, and we have people from all over, so that we identify with people from all over.、Uh, what happens in China is not as remote to us as it might be to people in some other countries, because there's so many people from China here in Canada. I mean, to a certain extent, we in Canada are there because they from China are here. Uh, and, uh, and and so we see、uh, the victims on our doorstep. I mean, not just、uh, Chinese in general, but Falun Gong practitioners. There's, there's plenty of them in, in Canada who are very、uh, sensitive, aware, active,、uh, history, got evidence, and and so on. That's one reason. Another, I would say, is that from Canada, we、uh, are. At relatively safe、uh, in dealing with this issue. In、uh, if if you do in China what I'm doing in Canada, you would end up in jail. I, I mean,、uh, 
uh, Gao Zhisheng is a good example of what, what happens uh, uh, if you do uh, in China what, what I'm trying to do in Canada. So that, uh, we, we can do in, in, in Canada what people in, in China cannot do, and I, and, and I think we have to take advantage of that. That's right. In your first book of Bloody Harvest, you and Ms. David Kugler pointed out that the organ harvesting in China was systematic and widespread. Could you please explain how systematic it was? Uh, obviously, we're dealing with a situation where we don't have the Chinese records, uh, and the Chinese government is denying everything. They're trying to cover up everything. Uh, and so we're not in a position to tell you uh, names, dates, t uh, times, places of every single organ transplant operation. Uh, we get information from Falun Gong uh, prisoners who were in prison in China, got out of prison and got out of um, uh, China, we've got some information from uh, prisoners who were not Falun Gong but could see what was going on in prison. We have information from transplant tourist patients who went into China, got their transplants and then uh, came out. Uh, we have uh, investigative calls made by callers into Chinese hospitals and courts and asking these places if they had organs of Falun Gong practitioners for sale. And what we're able to do is piece together a picture of where this is happening in China. And what we see is it's happening everywhere. Is that the, we have calls, we have uh, patients, uh, we have uh, prisoners that are going, I mean, it, it, it identified with virtually every lo uh, major location in China. It, it, it's, uh, it's a pervasive practice in China from the evidence that we've accumulated. About the systematic issue you just discussed, would you say that this is the state policy pushing forward by the government with the goal of eliminating Falun Gong in China? Uh, I, I've given a paper on this at a conference, uh, a genocide conference in uh, San Francisco this year. I, I do think uh, what's happening uh, in uh, with the Falun Gong community in China is genocide in the sense that there's an intent to destroy the group by in whole or in part. Uh, now, uh, given the volume of transplants and the volume of Falun Gong practitioners, uh, it's more, I would say, an intent to destroy the group in part rather than whole because there's an estimated, uh, at the time of the banning, the government estimated there's 70 to 100 million Falun Gong practitioners. The uh, transplants are at the rate of 10,000 a year, and obviously uh, that's not going to eliminate Falun Gong in a, as a group when you're dealing with uh, 70 to 100 million people. It, it, it would take forever to do that. But it, it, it's a partial elimination. Now, in terms of um, policy, the uh, I would say it, it's... If you look at uh, the uh, doctrines of responsibility at international law, command responsibility or superior responsibility, it doesn't just happen because somebody orders something. It also happens because somebody in charge knows what's going on and doesn't stop it. Uh, and uh, I would say at the very least that there's that sort of uh, responsibility that uh, I also believe that the Standing Committee uh, of uh, the Communist Party of China knows that this is happening and is not stopping it. And so uh, they are uh, uh, complicit in that sense. The people whose organs have been harvested died one after another. So no single victim was survived to testify. When you are attending a conference or giving speeches around the world, did you have ever difficulties to convince the audience? Not really. Uh, well, I, I, I suppose the only difficulty uh, I have is that, as I say, there isn't one simple, single piece of evidence that you could just pull out and convince somebody in 25 seconds, uh, which may be why it, it, it hasn't got the media play in major uh, television networks, because it, 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 it doesn't easily reduced to a 10 second soundbite. Uh, but anybody who's sat down and gone through the evidence, gone through Bloody Harvest uh, in, in the previous reports, is convinced. In fact, uh, yesterday, in addition uh, to the book launch on Hamilton, there was a public forum on this issue. And um, 
somebody in the audience, I don't know who it was, says, you know, it's impossible to disagree with this once you read through all the evidence. It's just uh, o o overwhelming. Right after your first book was published in 2006, the Chinese Ministry of Health had a new regulation that they banned the sales of human organs and that any organ transplant must be agreed upon the donors. To the best of your knowledge, has the practice of organ harvesting of live Falun Gong practitioners ever stopped since then? No, no. Uh, the, uh, I should say that our report first came out in 2006 in, in, in July and then a second version in January 2007. But the book, uh, which was the third version of the report, came out in November 2009. And, uh, well, the Chinese government, uh, I mean, they enact all sorts of laws. You can look at their constitution, which uh, asserts all sorts of freedoms. The um, Chinese laws are cosmetic, uh, they're propaganda. Uh, there's no mechanism for enforcement of the laws because the, the courts are not independent from the Communist Party. The, the courts take direction from the Communist Party. You don't have to take my conclusions about uh, the disrespect for this 2006 law. Wang Jiefu, Deputy Minister of Health, the November 2009, said himself that the, the sale was, of organs was still going on. He gave a speech about how it should be stopped, uh, and he personally seems opposed to it, but he acknowledged it was still happening three years later. Recently, there was a congressional hearing held in U.S. about the organ harvesting in China. They heard the organ harvesting testimonies by Falun Gong practitioners, political dissidents, and minority groups. Meanwhile, there have also been rumors saying the Chinese Communist Party took organs from the prisoners. Of the total organ transplants that took place in China in recent years, what percentage would you estimate that the organs came from Falun Gong practitioners? Well, in, in, in this book, State Organs, uh, there, I do have a chapter uh, on uh, numbers, and Ethan Gutman has a chapter on numbers as well. And uh, 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 dealing with numbers is difficult because, as I say, China is involved basically in cover-up. Uh, they don't publish death penalty statistics. They have four transplant registries, the, uh, one of them is in Hong Kong, and in each of these transplant registries, I think one's for kidney, one for heart, one for lung, uh, uh, and one for liver. The liver in Hong Kong. The liver in Hong Kong used to be public uh, and then we and others started quoting it so they shut it down uh, on the basis that they didn't like the analysis they were, we were making uh, from their figures. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, Deputy Minister of Health and Wang Jiefu has given a speech based on some of these figures but the, the speech uses contradictory figures. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, with the death penalty, we've got Amnesty International reporting, uh, tabulating reported death penalty cases. Uh, what we could see is, is uh, at least in terms of government claims, they do make periodic assertions about volumes of transplants. And, and, and there's, they were saying when we started out it was 10,000 a year and then they were fiddling with the death penalty and the, and the volume went down and now it's, uh, 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 in terms of, when I say fiddling with the death penalty, they, they transferred responsibility for imposition of the death penalty from regional courts to the Supreme Court and they cut down on the number of death penalty offenses. Uh, and so the death penalty volumes went down and it le led to a decrease in transplant volumes. But then uh, the transplant volumes went back to uh, traditional levels, uh, even though um, the death penalty volumes are down. And they started a deceased donor system, but the uh, number of deceased donors is statistically insignificant. And, and of course, a deceased donor is a gives a donation while alive, and then you have to wait till the person dies, so it's not actually a donation, it's a promise of a future donation. Uh, living donors, uh, there's been a scam, and they've been trying to shut it down, and they, and, and they acknowledge that uh, living donations are bad for the donor's health, so they've been trying to decrease that. Uh, the living donation law says only relatives and, and people have been faking uh, relative associations in order to sell organs. I mean, that would basically be only kidneys. Uh, so we're left with all these various strands of information and uh, my estimate based on that is that when we started out that out of the 10,000 a year transplants about 7,500 uh, came from 
Falun Gong and about 2,500 came from death penalty and others. Uh, Ethan Gutman has identified other sources, other prisoners of conscience, Uyghurs, uh, house Christians, uh, Tibetans all, also being sourced, but no, obviously not in the same numbers because these uh, are, are smaller phenomena. And in um, my estimation now, after the decrease in the death penalty, is that the actual Falun Gong sourcing has gone up to about uh, 8,500 out of the 10,000. So, so that's my estimate now. Throughout all these years, you have been participating activities around the world to expose the crimes of organ harvesting in China. In your opinion, which organizations should or could actively participating in this kind of efforts to stop the crimes? Oh, there's a number of different organizations that could be involved, in fact have been involved, uh, uh, could be helpful and in some cases have been helpful. Uh, there's the whole transplant professional community uh, and to a certain extent state organs is a, re a reflection of the interest of that community because many of the authors in that book are, are transplant professionals. Uh, Gabe Danovich, uh, Art Kaplan, uh, uh, Ghazali uh, Ahmed uh, from uh, Malaysia and uh, Torsten Trey, he's not a transplant professional but he's a doctor, uh, Maria Singh uh, from Australia, also a doctor. Uh, so uh, uh, there is, the, I would say, the transplant community and, and, the, and there is an international association of transplant professionals called the, Trans, the Transplantation uh, Society which has been uh, active not only in setting ethical standards generally, but dealing specifically with the phenomenon of China and the sourcing of organs from prisoners. We've been also dealing with the World Medical Association, which hasn't been as helpful, but they have been in some discussions with the Chinese Medical Association about uh, this issue. And of course, each of these international associations have national counterparts who, who could be useful and in some cases are. There's the whole uh, human rights community, uh, the various human rights non-governmental organizations. Uh, again, uh, some of them have been very helpful. Uh, the International Society for Human Rights, uh, headquartered in uh, Frankfurt, uh, their Swiss, Swiss branch has been very active in combating this issue and, uh, and, and conducted a campaign and, and gave David Kilgore a, a prize and a platform. Uh, Human Rights Without Frontiers, uh, headquartered in Belgium, has also been very active in this issue. Uh, the, uh, and, and again, they've been trying to organize uh, advocacy to the European Union and g given us a platform also. Amnesty International in Switzerland was active on the particular issue of uh, clinical testing of pharmaceutical drugs in uh, China, of, uh, of anti-rejection drugs, where the sourcing of organs uh, for the anti-rejection drugs was prisoners. So. They've been helpful there, uh, although not more generally. There uh, is uh, the ethical community, the professional um, academic uh, ethics, uh, medical ethics community, which has been helpful. Uh, there was a conference organized in Houston which produced a book which focused in large uh, part around that issue. Uh, of course, parliamentarians and, uh, and civil servants who worked through their Civil servants work through their governments and parliamentarians work through their parliaments. And, but uh, again, we've seen uh, some responsiveness in, in, in these various parliamentary and governmental entities. So I would say there's definitely uh, uh, activity and buy-in on, on the issue. N not enough, obviously. I mean, the abuse hasn't stopped. In fact, it's accelerated. But uh, there's been changes. I mean, you mentioned the 2006 law and there's been other changes since. So that there's been movement in the field and, and, and my hope is eventually that movement will result in, in real positive reform. So last question. If uh, this crime has been widely exposed and many, many people in the world, all government uh, know the truth of the life organ harvesting uh, in China. So what will be the impact to the communist regime for today? Well, I, I mean, my view, uh, I mean, the communist, the communist regime is not elected. Uh, it, it rules by force. It's, uh, it's an imposition on the people of China. It's, it's a Western imposition. I mean, communism is a Western import. Uh, and, and to a certain extent, that's uh, why uh, the communists are so afraid of uh, Falun Gong, because, uh, I mean, n not only is it moral when the communist regime is immoral, it's also 
authentically Chinese. Uh, it's it's, it's a blending and updating of uh, ancient Chinese tradition, the exercise traditions and the spiritual traditions. And, 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 uh, and, and of course, it is spiritual, and the communist regime is atheist. Uh, and, and, and so this, uh, um, the, the communist regime feels that uh, the uh, Falun Gong is, is, is antithetical to everything they stand for, and, and, and a real threat to them ideologically, to their ideological supremacy because of its, its roots in, in, in the real China, so to speak. And uh, I mean, I, w I would, uh, like to see a China that, that is democratic, that is free, that is diverse, uh, where people could be free to be Christians and Falun Gong, and and uh, the uh, I mean my specific uh, uh, role in all this is is to try to end the killing of Falun Gong for their organs. I, I mean I I would say that the killing of Falun Gong for their organs. Uh, discredits mightily uh, the, the communist regime. But of course, I mean, Tiananmen Square discredited them very badly. Uh, and so my view is, and I think we should learn from Tiananmen Square, I, I mean, just establishing beyond doubt that the communist regime has done something horrible isn't enough by itself to remove the regime. Uh, because uh, they, they, it's not... Uh, there's a lot of censorship that goes on. I, I mean, how was the re regime able to survive Tiananmen Square uh, when, it, it, as I say, it was broadcast publicly? Well, uh, I mean, it was a combination uh, of, of brute force and propaganda. I mean, this is Mao Zedong uh, you, 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 ideology. You stay in power through the pen and the sword. Uh, the, uh, it's a combination of uh, and, and censorship and so on. And we see that with our report. And I mean, one of the things that's actually interesting now uh, is that our report and everything associated with it was banned from China until this dispute uh, about Bo Xilai and Wang Lishan. And, and, and once uh, there was an attempt to get Bo Xilai uh, out of the standing committee in the Communist Party uh, and Chongqing, all our stuff became public. And, and it's still public. You can still see it in China. Uh, and, and that tells me that this is part of the internal power struggle. Uh, that, uh, I mean, the reason it's there is it's an attempt to discredit Bo Xilai and his faction, Zhou Yang Kang and Zhang Zemin, who have been instrumental, the leaders in the, in the persecution of Falun Gong. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I don't know where this is all going to end, but it leads me to think that... Uh, you know, uh, that it may lead to some alleviation in the plight of Falun Gong because uh, the abuse of Falun Gong is being used against the abusers, I mean the lead abusers. Uh, and, and so without a complete change in the regime, I, I think there's some reason to hope that uh, there might be a, at least in the short term an alleviation in the plight of the Falun Gong in China. Thank you very much for okay. your great efforts and for this interview. Okay, Thank thanks. Thanks again. 好,观众朋友,希望您更多的了解这方面的真相,并帮助制止这个地球上从未有过的邪恶。好,再见。